really an honor to stand here before you. Not to sing, because I do that a lot, but to speak, and it, and it freaks me out a little bit too, to be honest. If I could sing this, uh, I, I would. <laughs> but, uh, when I first heard the name of the series, uh, Sukkot Voices, I thought, man, that's an awesome name for a choir. You know, I always think music. That's where my am. And Joey was like, no. It, you know, it's, a, it's a series where we want to hear from you know, people in our congregation, and would you teach? And I said, yes, and I think I immediately knew what it is that I want to share with you. So I want to give you a little bit of insight and in how my brain works. So he said, Sukkot Voices, and okay, it's not a choir, okay. Sukkot Voices, Voices, Voice. The Voice. Oh, it's a TV show. The Voice. So I, and then I was thinking about The Voice. And, and I was like, that is such a cool show. We used to uh, look at it in the Netherlands, The Voice of Holland. And, um, and recently we've started watching here in the United States and so much talent. So I was, I was thinking about, you know, watching that show with my daughter and then I was thinking, and I'm going to share openly with you. Do you know how many times after a worship service in church in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany, people have come up to me and said, oh, you're such a beautiful voice. Why don't you join a competition like The Voice or, um, you know, America's Got Talent or The Netherlands Got Talent or something like that. And I'll tell you, there is not a hair on my head that seriously ever considered or is considering joining a competition. And I have two answers, or two explanations for that. One is really spiritual and, and one not so much. And so since we're in the synagogue, since we're in the house of the Lord, I'm going to start with the spiritual one. And then I'll give you the other one. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay, spiritual one. Here it is. When I sing, I want to sing to the glory of God. I don't want people to see me. I want them to see God. I love hosting the presence. I love to see people have an encounter and, and leave differently than how they came in. It's the highest honor. I can't leave them anything else. Was that good? Okay. That's, that's really what I feel like about 90%. And then there's the other 10%. I'm going to be really honest with you. I am too scared to do that. I'm too scared to, to enter a competition because I'm scared of rejection. I'm scared of rejection, honestly. I can't think of anything worse than singing your heart out to, to the back of a chair. And then, and then they don't, you know, you know they, they, yeah, they have this button and then, and it happens sometimes that they sing and no, no one of the jury turns around. Ouch! I'm scared, guys. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just, I don't like it. No, in my core, I have something that is called, please don't reject me. And you know why it hits home so much? I do a great job of rejecting myself. I do. And you know, I, I smile a lot and I laugh a lot and you know, I, I enjoy most of my time. But underneath all of this, you know, when I go home and everything quiets down, did I sing that okay? Did I miss, wasn't I guitar in tune? I don't think it was. Wait, let me go back to the recording. Did Joey post something? Oh, he did, let me listen. You see, I missed one. I missed one. And I have that even in the house of God, even when I know 90% of me that it's not about me. So I, I'll, I'll tell you that ever since I was small, I knew I wanted to sing. I remember being 14. I have this vivid memory of being 14 and standing in front of the uh, mirror with my hairbrush slash microphone. All right? Hello. Yeah. And I would sing all that Whitney Houston had to offer. All that she put out, I would sing that. 
And I enjoyed it so much, I got 90%. The other 10% of me compared. I can't sing like her. I can never belt out a note the way she does. Who am I kidding? You know, even when they tell me, oh, that was great, I know that they're really thinking, not so hot, not so great. 14, and I was already rejecting. You know, you know, the gift that God gave me. And so I chose another another path. I'm not going to pursue music. I'm not going to pursue singing. I'm going to pursue something in the medical field that I know a skill. You know, when you do it, you do it right. And, you know, that's what I'm going to do. And I'll do singing on the side. And God blessed it, really. God, God blessed my decision, but it was my decision. And all those years... Um, semi-fulfilled in what I did, I felt this vibration, you know, deep in my heart, something that I suppressed, hosting the presence, you know, writing a new song for churches to sing, uh, making new melodies, bringing tools of freedom to a congregation. That was deep in me. But I chose something else, and I, I want to talk to you about today is what is deep within you. I'm going to come close if that's okay. I want to talk about what's vibrating deep within you. Um, because I think we all have those moments, we've all had those moments where we, you know, you, you sense something. You sense something. Is this what God wants me to do? And then you reason your way out of it. Or other people tell you, you, you can't do that. You're too tall. You're too short. You're a woman. You're a man. And you can't do that. You don't, you don't have the right education. Nobody's going to want to read your book. And, and how, this is how we, we step away from the call. And I'm going to call it today. I'm going to call it your song. Not Whitney Houston's song, but your song. Amen. And we step away from that because of all kinds of reasons. And I want to do that by a story, by sharing a story with you. And I don't think anybody here knows this woman's name. You know her husband's name, and you know at least one of her son's name. But I'll be surprised, well, you know, uh, if you know her name. Okay, I'm going to give it away. Her husband's name is Jesse. We're in Hebrew, Yishai. Are we, do we know what we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So her youngest son's name is David. Who am I talking about? Yes. So, so but I'm talking about Jesse's wife and. Nobody's yeah. <laughs> David's mama. He had a mama. I had to have had a mama. If, if, if you don't believe me, you say, well, how do you know for sure that he had a mom? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to get it out of here. <laughs> um, so Psalm, Psalms 80, 86 verse 16, he says, Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength in behalf of your servant. Save me because I serve you just as my mother did. There you go. <laughs> he had a mom. Yeah? Okay. But who was she? How come that we don't know her name? Was her contribution not important? I think it was. Her name, Mitzvet. 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 And her song I call a bold song of silence. A bold song of silence. I'll go sit to and cover her story. We have to go with what we have. So we have David's songs, we have 1 Samuel, which tells us, you know, how David got anointed and a bit of his story. Um, but there's not a whole lot in our scriptures to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. But there are more writings, Talmudic writings. There are extra biblical sources that do name her and that tell a little bit more of her story. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to use a little, a little bit of those writings. Is that okay? I'm going to do it, so yeah. 
<laughs> and, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so we'll start with Psalm 69, where David, this is what David wrote. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters. The floods engulf me. I'm worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail, looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause. Those who seek to destroy me, I am forced to restore what I did not steal. I am, a, I am a foreigner, this is verse 8, I am a foreigner to my mother's, to my own family, and I am a stranger to my own mother's children. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. And when I put on sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me. I am the song of the drunkards. You know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shamed. All my enemies are before you. This is verse 19. And this is 20. Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Whew! Not a good day. Not a good day. Why did David write this? Where is this coming from? Well, to uncover more of the story, like I said, we have to go into sources that are not that are not our scriptures. Um, so what we do know from scripture is that David was born to Jesse and his wife. Jesse was a prominent figure. He, he would serve as head of the Sinai and he was distinguished, he was looked highly upon. Okay, that's what we know. And David was the youngest of some gorgeous sons. If, if, you, if you read in Samuel, it's this tall boy, and then Samuel thought, well, surely this one is king. Yeah. And all of them were paraded before him. So, so beautiful sons, youngest boy, David, the scripture says he has red hair. Okay. Um, and then it says what we just read. He was a stranger to his brothers. Why? A foreigner to his mother's sons. Why? So I'm going to explain to you how we put this together. Let's imagine that the recording from today, Joey always puts it on the website. Let's, let's imagine that the recording from today is you're going to call that scripture, okay? And on that recording, you have evidence, you've seen me on this platform, and Stephen was there too. You see it, okay? That's scripture. Um, how did Stephen and me get here today? Who knows? Guess? By car. Probably by car, right? You won't see it on the website. You won't see us driving up to this, this congregation. But if you think about it logically, we live in Keller. We, we didn't walk here. Yeah? And if, if you would ask the same question in the Netherlands, you could get a different answer. People could say, well, maybe they came on the train, or maybe they came on a bike, because they haven't really thought about the Texas culture, and we don't walk here, we drive, right? Okay. So that won't be on the video, but you kind of know that has to be true, right? Yes. Okay, so how did we drive? We live in Keller. This congregation is in Arlington. Which road did we take? Could be. Could be. You can take some back roads too. The truth is, you don't know. We just have to imagine. Probably they took Davis. And then I went on the 820 South, but maybe it took a little You don't know. We just imagine. In this story, there are parts that we know, we know, we know in scripture. There are some parts that we just know because of culture. 
And there are some parts that we, we kind of fill in the blank. Maybe this is what happened. So one part that we just don't know for sure that it's a fill in the blank is that Jesse, happily married with his wife, gorgeous sons, suddenly turns his heart away from her. Um, it reads, or yeah, it reads in some writings that uh, Jesse, do you do you remember who his grandparents are? Boaz and Ruth. So some stories say that Jesse started to doubt his heritage. Is his grandma, if his grandma is a Moabite, then what am I really? Huh? And if I am not a hundred percent pure, you know, Jewish man, why am I married to this gorgeous, beautiful Jewish woman? I might be bringing a curse on my house. Could have happened. We don't know. What we do know is that he sent her off. He sent her to live separate. After a few years, Jesse wanted to have more children. And um, he didn't want to have married relations with his wife, who he sent to live separately. But there was a maid servant in the house. So nowhere is her name mentioned. The only thing that is mentioned is that she was uh, Canaanite woman, a maidservant, Canaanite. One plus one is two. If I want another child, you know, why don't we do the Rachel Villa thing? You know, we just have, I have a child with her. So he talks to her about it. She runs to her mistress, Nitzavet, living separately, and she tells her, Jesse is about to do this. And Nitzavet weeps, torn and anguished. And her maidservant's com maidservant comes up with a plan. Let's learn from our ancestress, she said. Let's do like Rachel and Leah. So y'all know the story. So when it was night, Jesse wasn't paying attention. He fathered a child with his wife, it's a bit. I don't know how he didn't know that, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, all right. Okay. After a few months, Nitzavet's pregnancy becomes obvious. Now what? Now what? All hell broke loose, we imagine, because the story says that her sons want to kill their mom. And this, this, was, this was custom. If you are an adulterer, your own family will come. Throw you up, you know, to, say, to put it mildly. Jesse intervenes. And he says, don't kill her, but let her and the boy continue to live, or this, the, the child continue to live separate from us. And the child will be a servant, despised and rejected. That was what was done. Nitzavet had a boy, his name was David, and they lived separate from the other family. Remember the song where he says, I'm, I'm, you know, rejected by my mother's sons, a stranger in my family. The interesting thing is that the word stranger um, in Hebrew is muzar, which comes from the same root as mamzer, which means bastard or illegitimate child. So when he says, I'm a stranger in my family's house, he could have been saying, I'm, a, I'm an illegitimate child. Disaster, you know? Ugh. Nitzavet song. Why didn't she speak up? This is what was going through my, my mind. Speak up, woman. You have to, you know, you have to tell him what he did. Tell him, like, you know, you remember, you thought you remember it, but it was me and I'm pregnant, look like the boy, look like you. I don't know. Defend yourself. She said nothing. And the Talmud says that she said nothing because she didn't want to embarrass. Jesse. She loved him so much that what she felt her song was, was a song of standing in silence, taking what was coming to her, just like 
Tamar and Judah, remember that story? Tamar refused to accuse to, uh, Judah, even if it meant, you know, being burned, I think. Or stoned, yeah. She said nothing. She continued to say nothing when she and her son lived despised and rejected for 28 years. She said nothing. Until one day, the prophet Samuel comes to the house with the task to anoint a new king, right? And you know the story, every son passes by Samuel. No, not that one. No, that's a Lord. This must be no. Okay, next one. Okay, all the sons are, I've seen all the sons. And then he prophetically asks Jesse. He doesn't ask him, do you have more sons? He asks him, are there more boys? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Because he, if he would have asked, do you have more sons? I don't know what he would have said. Maybe Jesse would have said, no, I don't have more sons. But because Samuel said, are there more lads? Are there more boys? Jesse said, yes, there is one, a small one, a little one. And he lives separate. He's in the field. So you know the story, David gets called, he needs to wash up before he comes. And I just imagine, no other, no other writings say this, but I just imagine what was going through Nitzavet's head. Why are they calling for David? Is this the day where they decide to kill him? Nobody's touching my boy. She goes to the house. She goes to the house and she stands. Where is it? Such a beautiful word. Well, it was a word like from a distance. She stands in the shadows, in the shadows, yes. And she observes what happens. And then the oil in, in Samuel's cup, you know, starts to almost bubble of joy. Like, this is the one, this is the one. And boom, David is anointed king. And we, we got to speak to Jesse because Jesse's heart turns and his eyes are opened. He accepts the boy as his boy. His eyes are opened. And, He's a righteous man. He, 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 he embraces David. And the story doesn't say anything about Nitzvah, but I, I imagine that he embraces her. The brothers, you know, a little bit, but, you know, a little bit of that behavior still continued after. But what did Nitzvah, Nitzvah teach David in those 28 years? And this is a real question. You can give a real answer. What did she teach him? Trusting God, patience, trials. Turn the other cheek. Yeah. She forgive. accept, huh? To forgive, yeah. To not seek revenge. Yeah, her song, you could say, her legacy, her unique role in this story, by saying nothing, was teaching him. Wait, redemption is coming. Yes. Redemption is coming. We're not going to fight this thing with in our own power. We're going to wait for redemption to come. Another thing, if David would have grown up in the household, just like you know, one happy family, the youngest boy, what kind of boy would you think he would have been? Little spoiled, right? Look at Joseph. Ew, he had to spend some time in the well and in a prison to get that out of him. David spent his first 28 years in the well and in prison. He learned to not expect anything, to not be entitled to anything. And when David was, you know, after his, his, his um, anointing, I forgot how many years it took for him to become king. Like 13 years or something? Couple of years of trials, of running, of hiding. I think his mom's song, standing firm in the face of opposition, trained him to do that. He he was accustomed to being outside, rejected, sped upon. Let's talk about the son of David, Yeshua. Come on, Sunday, right? 
What was he called? One of his, one of the things Isaiah says he was despised, rejected. rejected. Same words as used for David. When he was accused and sped upon, what did Yeshua do? Stand still. He didn't defend himself. And I always thought, okay, that's the divine part of Yeshua. Because the human part, you know, let me show you what I got. But could it be, could it be, and it's not written anywhere, could it be that Yeshua got a little bit of this from his great, 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 grandma, Nitzvah? Could it be that in his DNA, even his human DNA, Yes. Was a trained redemption is coming. Yes. I have my eye on the prize. Yes. My heart is beating for humanity. Yes. Yes. And if I have to wait, 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 I'm waiting. I'm waiting. So, my question for you today is what's your song? And the whole thing, the whole thing about calling is usually. We always think it has to be something loud and big and, and you know glamorous. Something like the voice. <laughs> For me, I had to learn and I'm still sometimes learning. I can't sing anybody else's song. I have to sing mine. I can't do someone else's call. I have to do mine. What is God calling you to do? And probably it is something you have known from when you were this small. If I take a guess. And it probably looks different. Looks different than what you thought it would. Or than even the church taught you that it should be. Um, I know what, you, you know, worship context, I know what a successful worship leader looks like, you know, and usually they're not um, 43 like I am. And I can tell you a whole lot more of doubts that, you know, crawl in the back of my head. What is God calling you to? And what excuses or fears or different ideas or different decisions are you, are you Putting before him. Can I just tell you that the moment you embrace you, yes. the moment you embrace you with all of it, with yes. all of it, yes. you embrace the Father, and the moment you really say, Yes, okay, I'll sing the song that you put into me. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Frustration leaves, anxiety leaves. You can just do that. Yes. And even if people reject it or you, you'll be fine. It might hurt, it might sting, but you know who you are and you know whose you are. Amen. Yeah. What are you speaking of yourself and the dream God has placed in? The tongue has the power of life and death, yes. and those who love it will eat its fruits. Those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. What are you speaking over yourself? Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent yes. and discerning if they hold their tongue. Yes. Sometimes we just need to not speak. Amen. Amen. Talk about myself. <laughs> Proverbs 31 says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Are we doing that? Isn't Joey teaching us that the weightier matters of Torah are always about freeing the oppressed, right, Joey? Yes. Are we speaking up for the oppressed? Words from the mouth of the wise are gracious. Fools are conserved, consumed by their own lips. Are we consumed by our own you know, our own little fears and our own little ideas. Psalm 71, 8. My mouth is filled with your praise. 
declaring your splendor all day long. I'm closing with this. Ultimately, anything, whatever it is that God is calling you to, and I don't care how old or how young you are or how big you think your influence is, we're all called. And the specifics of the call, whatever it is, it will always bring glory to God. Amen. It might not always win you favor with men, but that's not what this is about. This yes. is whether your call is at home, school, or in the workplace, glorify God. Whether it is going through a desert right now or on a mountain, declare His praises, declare His glory. If your call, if your song is a is a bold and, and, and loud one at the moment, declare his praise with it. If it is like Nitzavet, a bold song, silence, praise God, declare his glory. Amen. Amen.